These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. All right, so I think we've talked about the idea of wave-particle duality. Wave-particle duality is the idea that everything has both wave and particle characteristics. And in certain situations, it's helpful to focus on the wave characteristics, and other times you want to focus on the particle characteristics. So, for example, in this uh, problem, we're focusing on a particle. We're focusing on a particle. However, because of wave-particle duality, it also has wave characteristics, which means that it has a wave function that describes the wave. And the symbol for the wave function that we're going to be using here is psi. So this is the symbol psi for the wave function. Uh, so what is the thing that's waving? If this is really a particle, what's the thing that's waving? What does psi represent? Uh, well, in a sense, nothing is really waving. In a sense, you could, uh, roughly speaking, you can think of psi as representing the probability of detecting the particle in certain positions. This is the probability of detecting the particle in certain positions, uh, roughly speaking. So we have to try to clarify that a little bit. But roughly speaking, psi tells us the probability of finding the particle in certain places. Now, in real life, you're usually dealing with an object in three-dimensional space. In real life, an object is usually in three-dimensional space, but the math for that is too hard for an introductory course like this. So in your problems, you're usually dealing with a particle in a one-dimensional space, what they call a one-dimensional box. So we're going to imagine that the particle is trapped in, say, a one-dimensional box. So this might be the box. And then maybe the wave function psi, the wave function psi might look like this. Well, I said that the psi represents the probabilities. That was only roughly speaking. To be more accurate, it's the wave function squared that's the probabilities. The square of the wave function is the probabilities. So I could take this function here and I could square it, and then all the uh, displacement, so to speak, would be positive. So then this might be what psi squared looks like, approximately speaking. All right, and then how do we figure out the probability that the particle, say, would be detected in this region? How can we figure out the probability that the particle is detected in this region? Well, it's the area under the curve. The probability that, the probability that we're going to detect the particle in a certain region is the area under the psi squared curve. It's the area under the psi squared curve. Remember from calculus, though, that that is the integral of the curve. Uh, an area under a curve is an integral. So if this is point A and this is point B, then the probability that we would be in this region would be you'd have to take the integral of psi squared from point A to point B. That'll tell you this area here, and that's what's going to tell us the probability of finding the particle there. If you wanted to know the probability that the particle was between these two regions, you would take this integral and you would figure out this area over here. And now, of course, the psi squared doesn't have to look like this. I just invented uh, something for it to look like. But whatever the curve looks like, the areas under the curve give you the probabilities. The areas under the curve give us the probabilities, which means that the integrals give us the probabilities, which means that we have to review a little calculus uh, to be able to work with this. OK, so but the basic idea is that probabilities are given by integrals of the psi squared curve. Uh, not of psi, but of psi squared. So we have to remember to square the wave function. The wave function itself doesn't really have much meaning, but the square has a meaning because it tells us the probabilities. All right, so moving along. In this example, we're told we have a particle that is trapped in a box of length L.
Again, this is what's called, it's, we call this is trapped in a box. The ends of the box are zero and L. <coughs> Here we can bring in another idea from quantum physics, which is we know in classical physics, particles can have any energy along a continuum. Uh, a particle could take on any energy. However, in quantum physics, only certain energy levels are possible. Only certain energy levels are going to be possible for this particle. Uh, and the energy levels are the energy levels you would get when n equals 1, or n equals 2, or n equals 3, or n equals 4. But you couldn't have, say, n equals 1.5, or n equals 2.5. So only certain energy levels are possible. Basically, that's because we could think of psi here as, like, as, as though it was a standing wave inside the box. But if you remember from last semester, only certain standing waves are allowed inside of a box. Only the waves that have a node at both ends. So only certain values of n are allowed here. <coughs> All right, so we're going to need to know what the function psi is for this box. Well, this is what's called, uh, notice that they said this is infinitely deep. So this is called the infinite box, the infinite square box. And there should be some formulas for that in your textbook. Do you have your textbook with you? Mm -hmm. Let's go to the uh, quantum mechanics chapter. That's the one. Let's look at the end of the quantum mechanics chapter. Okay, so here we have, this is what's called an infinite square well. So here's the picture of the infinite square well. Notice that the particle is trapped inside. And they're showing you pictures here that you can only have certain set standing waves. You can only have standing waves with a node at both ends. n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. And uh, you can have any infinite number of ends. All right, um, and then the equations here describe the characteristics of the infinite square well. For example, they gave us here what the psi function is, psi sub n. So we just have to look this formula up for the uh, infinite square well. So here's the formula in the book for the infinite square well. How do we know to use this formula? Because the problem said it was trapped in an infinitely deep potential well. Uh, what does capital L stand for? Um, length of the box. Yeah, the length of the box <laughs> or the length of the well. All right, and remember that we're seeing that um, only certain wave functions are allowed. The wave functions are quantized. Only certain wave functions are allowed. You can have wave function 1 if you plug in a 1 for n. Or you could have wave function 2 if you plug in a 2 for n. But you have to plug in a positive integer for n. You can plug in any positive integer for n, and that will give you um, size of n here. By the way, what would n be for the ground state? Yeah, the ground state is the lowest possible energy. Well, in this case, the lowest possible energy is n equals 1. So that would be the ground state. How about the first excited state? What would n be for the first excited state? 2. Yeah, it would be easy to get confused about that. The first excited state is the first state above n equals 1. So even though we have the word first here, the first excited state would actually be n equals 2, because the ground state is n equals 1. If they just said um, the, first, the, lowest, uh, the first energy level, that would be n equals 1. But if they say the first excited state, n equals 2. So the excited states are the states above the ground state. Okay, 
So these are the possible wave functions in uh, this case. However, remember that the wave function itself is not very interesting to us. What is it that actually tells us the probabilities? What tells us the probabilities? It's not psi. What do we have to do to psi to get the, the probabilities? Square. Square it. So before we do anything else, let's figure out what psi squared would be. So let's work that out algebraically. What would psi squared be here? You got it, that's right. 